everybody and welcome back. It's a live stream on this Saturday evening of the 11th of the 11th, 2023. And today we're going to be focusing on the various events um, related to the Palestine question. But the main focus is going to be on the uh, speech given by Hassan Nasrallah on Martyr's Day in Lebanon, the, where the Hezbollah movement celebrates the martyrs going all the way back to their struggles against the Israeli occupation of Lebanon in the 1980s. Before we begin, though, I will just say hello to those who are in the chat. So, James Graham, Jerry, Carmo, DE, good afternoon or good evening or good morning to you. Good morning to Ash in Melbourne on the other side of the world there. Jerry, hello to you, who says London was phenomenal. That is the march. There were still masses marching towards Vauxhall Bridge when I caught the train at 16.30. The first batch set around uh, at, uh, off at around 12.45. So that's very impressive numbers. That seems comparable to the biggest anti-war marches 20 years ago. And it's worth saying that there is no direct um, British involvement in this. There, there are a lot of there, there is direct British involvement, but not publicly acknowledged British involvement. We'll come to that later. Hello to Karen. Hello to Satyajit Malik. Hello to Beans. And glad you're liking the music. And good evening to Rob, uh, who's also loving the music. Uh, well, I, credit to the uh, suggestions of Irish Partisan for that one. Hello to Philbin, who says, Greetings, comrades, and solidarity even across the pond here in the Imperial Hegemon. We are amazed by a British march for free Palestine. I thought the DC turnout was big, yeah, but you dwarfed us. Well, just an aspiration for American friends to double the numbers and further turn your own reactionaries into a frothing piles of foam, which is what has happened to ours. Movie maker Joe says, hello all, caught the London protest today, the movement to regulate the structure of government, I hope can also be said to be fueled by deeper understanding. Mm -hmm. Good evening to Morgan and Ian Foster and Jenny Lynn, who says good afternoon. So um, for those of you who are unaware, there was a massive protest down in London today. I'll start with the, just a quick uh, overview of this. There has been, of course, um, something of an implosion uh, since the last time that I spoke to you. Because last time we spoke uh, following um, the back and forth between the government and the Metropolitan Police, uh, the government, or at least certain sections of it, were openly encouraging um, a fascist mob turnout. And this started in the so-called anti-woke circles, the um, likes of Douglas Murray. If you're not familiar with who Douglas Murray is, he's an odious uh, little pipsqueak who is a longtime supporter of uh, imperialist wars in the Middle East. He rebranded himself recently as like an anti-woke crusader, like a sort of uh, garbage British version of Ben Shapiro, but slightly older and just as short. And he started calling for what he called a patriotic mobilization. And now when a man like that with the politics that he has starts calling for a patriotic mobilization, there's only really one group of people that he's talking to. And that are, of course, the various uh, ragtag fascist elements that do exist in Britain. And his, his call was seized upon by Suella Braverman, the uh, Home Secretary who has aspirations to lead the Conservative Party, following its seemingly inevitable defeat at the next general election. Uh, we can but hope that the next general election delivers chaos and not a coherent government, though. So she picked this up and decided to play with it as well. Their aim was to create a sense of crisis, to uh, push the Metropolitan Police into asking uh, for, the, to withdrawing the permission for the march to go ahead and stating that it should be banned. And of course, for various different reasons, the Met Police didn't do that, not because they're enamoured of the free Palestine cause, but I think mainly it reflected divisions in the British ruling class as to how to deal with this. They didn't want to, well, some of them at least, didn't want to come out 
and openly ban this because that would look incredibly bad for them. Like they've seen Macron's done that and Macron's done that and he's ended up looking incredibly weak because he's decided that they should be banned, these marches, and they've gone ahead anyway. So he looks ineffective. So they didn't want to do that. They also didn't want to stir up things too much. I think they also were have a problem within their own ruling class circles, which is that there's a division on the way forward here. Then that's reflected in media coverage of the Israel question, which, whilst still propagandistic and awful, is a little bit more critical towards the Israel side than, um, say, the coverage on Ukraine, which is absolutely uniform and still is. So. Today, we saw the sum total of the fascist mobilization. Now, according to the pictures that I saw, and I emphasize I wasn't there, uh, one trip to London a month is more than enough for me. Um, but the pictures I saw, and if anybody was there, feel free to contradict me on this. It looked like there was no more than about 300 fascist and uh, reactionary football uh violence lovers um, out there clustered around the cenotaph having a ruck with the police and then there was some brawling afterwards um, a, a, a tiny bit amounts of it in the street but the most they could if the best they could do was two to three hundred then that's not a particularly impressive turnout from the fascist side of things considering that even uh, the Police estimate was 300,000 for the demonstration, which means it was probably m far more than that. Judging from the pictures that I saw, I'd say the demo was five to 600,000 at least. And if the fascists could only manage 300, that's not very good from their point of view. The most the so-called English Defence League ever managed was, in my memory, two to 3,000. And that was in Manchester about 11 or 12 12 years ago i think 2011 it was when they they were at their peak and it must be emphasized that for the fascists to get any grip um at all not only do you need a society that's in the grip of a profound crisis of capitalism which we are but also that a significant section of the bourgeoisie has to swing behind them and start funding them and organizing them and here we uh, get into the the realm of the discussion of what is the nature of bourgeois rule and the state and the bourgeois dictatorship, because this helps to clarify questions also about what the future proletarian dictatorship will look like. Now, the bourgeois dictatorship isn't just the state. Of course, though, that is the most central and important part of it and its associated forces, its bodies of armed men. And of course, its intelligence services and its permanent bureaucracy. That's where an awful lot of power and, of course, authority resides but the bourgeois dictatorship is much more than that it also of course is the dictatorship which rules over our lives in the private sphere as well as well as in the the public face of the state and it also comes in the form of not just state power but also the ability to move and use their their capital them or their money wherever they like and that includes of course backing political projects and they are they have backed in the past certain elements in the bourgeois have backed uh, the edl and backed the bnp and way before that we're talking 45 years ago now almost 50 years ago backed the uh, the old national front and there was others before that as well i mean there was um, fascist groups in the 60s uh, oswald mosley turned up again in the 60s and he had so he was of course from the aristocracy i hail from a city which was uh formerly owned by the mosley family uh back in the before it became a, a city in a real way when it was a small town uh manchester had a lot of its land owned by the mosley so he was he was he came from the bourgeoisie he came from money but there's always some bourgeois money and bourgeois influence behind these fascist organizations and the nature of the bourgeois dictatorship is that they get to do that. They get to fund violent extra parliamentary groups and they always get away with it. No one, as far as I know, and again, if anybody knows better than this, feel free to chime in. No bourgeois 
has ever been convicted in this country of funding and organizing a fascist organization. Various low-level fascists, street-level, lumpen, knuckle-dragging goons, have been convicted of various violent offenses over the years, including uh, the one guy who was done about, must be 23 years ago now, a guy called David Copeland, for planting nail bombs in various places, including gay bars. But no bourgeois figure has ever gone down for funding fascist organizations, even though we know, thanks to even um, the bourgeois press reports on the EDL, that they were getting money from a network of uh, very well-funded private organizations that were included organizations and individuals within the city of London. So the bourgeois dictatorship shows itself in that way. Um, the they are able to fund and keep in reserve these fascist organizations for when they feel like they need them. And the reason why the fascists didn't get a big turnout today, well, there's a couple of them. Firstly, uh, they didn't have enough notice to get out enough numbers. Their organizational level clearly isn't at the right level that would need, that would enable them to get a good turnout. Secondly, that the, that the ruling class themselves are in a quandary about it, as is the Conservative Party. Some elements in the Conservative Party want to encourage the growth of fascist mobs in the streets. That's clear. And another element of it, though, clearly doesn't and or doesn't think that it's necessary at this stage or think that Braverman and her crowd were too brazen in coming out and calling for it. And that's the um, that's the reality that for a lot of the Tory MPs, certainly um, they were afraid of the consequences of uh, seeing like in, in central London succumb to like a giant brawl, basically. And so the fascists turned out to be you know, not much of anything. They got in a ruck with the cops and a lot of them got arrested. And they should really send their legal bills to Suella Braverman, uh, who encouraged them to be there. But the march itself went ahead and was, I would say, successful in terms of numbers. We see the movement growing. We see it growing both inside Britain and the United States, both on the streets and in terms of extra uh, legal action, shall we say, including blocking um, this, the entrances to arms sites, um, for instance, these uh, BAE system sites, Elbit sites, etc. So there are certain aspects of this are going in the right direction. And we'll see what further impact this can have. It's already destabilized the Labour Party and the rule of Starmer, so we will see how far that can go. But to answer a question from Jenny Lynn in the uh, in the chat as to whether um, that Tommy Robinson has shown up again. By the way, Tommy Robinson, leader of the EDL, isn't his real name. His real name is Stephen Yaxley Lennon. I presume that he changed it to Robinson so it would sound less Irish. Um, He's this like fraudulent scumbag who has led the EDL and various other organizations as well. He's quite obviously an asset of the British state, um, quite bluntly. Most of the, the fascist leaders in this country, going back to Oswald Mosley, have had a relationship with the bourgeois state that's uh, rather dubious, shall we say. Um, but they, uh, they, they, they wheel him out. He gets wheeled out at times like this. Uh, just as I think that he was funded and put up to his activities in the late 2000s, early 2010s, because there was a, a situation where class struggle was heightening. And I think that having him out there and, of course, the other side of this, which is al Muhajirun, who also came out of Luton, as did the EDL, um, the, the idea of promoting like uh, basically race war doctrines was promoted by the bourgeois state, including by the likes of Robinson. And Robinson since then has been, he was imprisoned briefly, as a lot of these fascist guys are. They go to prison for a little while and the state gets them out again and they find new funding for a new venture. He never seems to be short of money. So someone in the, in the, the bourgeois state or its associated bodies is providing him and whatever organization he's involved in at the moment with money to um, mobilize and to avoid having to work so he he will be wheeled out and he's going to be um they're going to try and probably drum up either the edl or some other fascist type organization 
um, maybe so-called patriotic alternative. Who knows? But the fact is that they, whatever they tried to do today was massively overshadowed and they were massively outnumbered, so they couldn't really do much. So um, positive news on that front. I see that also there was a mobilization in Delaware outside Biden's house. I kind of hope he comes out for it in a confused fashion and uh, unwittingly confesses to various different things on camera, but we're, maybe we're not that lucky. So... Um, Moving on then to look at the speech that was given today by um, Hassan Nasrallah, the General Secretary of um, the uh, Hezbollah organization in Lebanon. And he gave a speech uh, eight days ago on Friday of last week uh, where he outlined basically the strategy that will be uh, used uh, by not just Hezbollah, not just the national liberation movement of the Palestinians, but also the uh, resistance movements in Syria and Iraq, because he very much draws all of them together. And what he did in his previous speech was he outlined to the, the U.S. imperialists, because that's who he was principally addressing in terms of his external audience. He was saying to them, well, you've sent all these military assets down here, but we have things to counter them. And we are not afraid of you. We are not afraid of your aircraft carriers or your aircraft. And if you continue down this road, then you will get a wider war in the Middle East. But for now, we are content to, well, not content, but we are engaging the Israeli enemy and causing them significant problems in the north. And the fact that the Israelis are escalating their bombing attacks on Lebanon shows that they are the northern front is plainly bothering them and is tying up a significant amount of their forces, as Nasrallah says it is. And Nasrallah said that that will continue and that they would only launch something wider if it came to the point where the Palestinian forces in uh, Gaza were looking like they were going to be defeated. So this was, of course, misunderstood deliberately, or maybe not, maybe deliberately is the wrong word. It was it was not understood properly because uh, the Israelis and their allies inside U.S. imperialism wanted to misinterpret it. They've made the same mistake that they always do with Putin, for instance. And I think that it's no coincidence that the fact that Putin, uh, throughout the last 18 months, has essentially slow-rolled um, Russian escalation towards threats from U.S. imperialism inside and around U the Ukraine and the special military operation there. Um, and now Nasrallah is adopting, a, I think, going down similar lines. And I think um, Nasrallah has always been a very effective leader because he is able to, he and the Hezbollah leadership, because it won't be just him, have been able to properly understand the nature of their enemy, which is not just Israel, but is U.S. imperialism. And so what they were saying, what he was saying in that speech last week, was he was outlining what Hezbollah has done so far and how it links into the wider movements in Syria and Iraq, which are directed against the continuing occupations uh, of uh, those countries by U.S. imperialism, and, of course, the actions of the Ansar Allah movement in Yemen. And he did the same thing again today, but he started with, of course, because it's a speech about uh, martyrdom. It's a speech on Hezbollah's uh, Martyrs Day. Now, he brought to mind a couple of interesting things. Um, and what, for one thing I didn't know about, uh, which was the um, 1982 uh, bombing of the headquarters of the Israeli occupation forces in the Lebanese city of Tyre, because, of course, the, as we've covered before, the, um, the Israeli forces uh, acting again with the uh, four as U.S. imperialism's ground troops sought to crush the PLO when it was, um, it was in Lebanon and was gathering forces there for a campaign against Israel. So Israel taking advantage of a Lebanese civil war that they and the U.S. imperialists had done an awful lot to stoke they invaded South Lebanon in 1978 and thus began the uh, long-running campaign to get them out of there, which would take another 
22 years, uh, but it was also the beginning of Hezbollah as a what was then an exclusively Shia Muslim movement in South Lebanon, which started off by attacking Israeli military columns with car bombs and suicide bombs. And in 1982, on November the 11th, 1982, um, they carried out a successful car bomb operation on the um, Israeli uh, military occupation headquarters in Tyre, which killed uh, 75 Israeli military and intelligence personnel. It was one of the biggest uh, loss, single lo losses of life that the Israelis had, um, uh, had in inflicted upon them uh, for many, many years. And it, that happens, of course, on November the 11th, 1982, which is why they have their Martyrs Day on November the 11th. It's uh, one of their debut operations that was publicly credited to them. And it's one of their big successes in that early part of the war. And of course, it was followed up by the um, b truck bombing of the um, U.S. Marine Corps barracks and the driving out of the American forces by Hezbollah actions. So very much uh, the early 80s is the, the birthing point of Hezbollah. And so that's an interesting note to start on. Now, Nasrallah walked through, again, what is going on. And he is addressing, uh, of course, inside Lebanon. He again made the point that the national liberation of Lebanon is not complete as yet because it is still the case that um, not only is uh, part of what's claimed as historic Lebanese lands in the form of the Sheba farms is still occupied by the Israelis, but also that the dominating presence of U.S. imperialism also compromises the sovereignty and independence of Lebanon. And this is where he drew the comparison, of course, with the U.S. presence in Syria and Iraq. And he said that the actions in Syria and Iraq uh, and of course in Lebanon on the occupied Palestine border. They're all part of a, of a unified movement, a unified series of actions with the Palestinian forces that are looking to exert pressure on U.S. imperialism. And he mentioned um, that U.S. imperialism is admitting now that it's got large numbers of uh, casualties, often with... Um, uh, what is it, severe headaches or brain injuries. If you remember that brain injury is the rather euphemistic way that the U.S. describes its casualties now a lot of the time. So when the uh, the Iranians bombed um, or mi did a missile attack on U.S. bases in Iraq in response to the uh, killing of um, Qasem Soleimani, or should I say more accurately, the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, and a leader of the Iraqi um, resistance movement as well. They mid did a missile attack on this U.S. base, having said to the, um, the, the U.S. basically that they were going to do it, and therefore they, they might want to get their men underground. So the U.S. appropriately um, emptied uh, certain aspects of their base, uh, knowing the Iranians were going to attack it, but they ended up with a load of people that they said were um, hospitalized with um, concussions and brain injuries. And that's what they're saying this time about the, Ira the Iraqi and Syrian uh, attacks on uh, the bases that the U.S. has in northern Syria and in Iraq. That there are people um, that soldiers have been admitted to military hospitals with brain injuries. And they're saying it's over 90 uh, U.S. personnel now. Uh, and that one guy, they were admitting to one death from a heart attack. And so Nasrallah referenced that and said, well, this is this is all part of the same struggle. This is all part of the same campaign. And he, what he was, what he seemed to be saying was, look, this is only going to intensify uh, the longer the uh, Israeli action carries on. Because he, he correctly pointed out that Biden could, if he so chose, end the Israeli attack on Gaza tomorrow. But of course, as I've outlined before, Biden isn't going to choose that. Now, Nasrallah goes on to make um, some more interesting points. And he may, principally, though, he's talking about the way in which this war is being waged. And 
it came it called to mind to me anyway the writings of Mao Chairman Mao from the late 1930s in a work uh, called On Protracted War which is what Nasrallah was talking about in this speech he's talking about the nature of this war and the fact that it's going to be uh, a protracted one and he talked in um, in terms of the resistance fighting for time and that he according to his analysis and I think he's correct uh, that the time is actually on the side of the regional resistance movement it's on the side of the Palestinians it's not on the side of the US imperialists and the Israelis and he pointed out that the damage that is being done to the Israeli economy by this war and he pointed out that the Israeli um, leadership appears to be in chaos they keep issuing different and wildly contradictory statements depending upon what hour of the day it is Netanyahu will say one thing in the morning and another thing in the evening and then say another thing again tomorrow morning and then be back to the original position there tomorrow afternoon and he says that these these guys have basically um, lost the plot they don't know um, what to do They're, they keep changing their objectives they keep saying that they're pursuing this they're pursuing that and on the on the ground they're still proceeding very slowly and very cautiously and you will we'll all have seen the various maps that have been published claiming oh we've completely cut off northern Gaza um, we control we put them in a box etc but then you you dig into what's going on of course the resistance forces the Palestinian national liberation fighters in Gaza seem to be able to still operate with a, de a degree of impunity uh, in terms of being able to move around and attack um, Israeli forces, retreat back into tunnels again. So it's clear that the Israelis might have stuck a lot of tanks down there and have um, publicly proclaimed that we've cut this off, we've cut that off, but they still are unable to control the area. So they've raised a flag on a beach and they've done various different things, but Nasrallah's point is, well, they still can't meet their objectives and they won't. And so far he's, he's, uh, events seem to be vindicating him so the other point that he kept coming back to was of course that this is a battle for time itself and that the resistance fights for time and also um, that he mentioned the role of the other Arab the other Arab leaders essentially not doing anything he repeated um, the fact that the point that he raised in the uh, previous speech which is that these Arab leaders he didn't name them directly can't even get the Rafa crossing open for the consistent delivery of um, humanitarian aid into Gaza which is, of course the Israelis don't want to see because they're still pursuing the starve out tactic which won't work if aid is getting in of course so that's become um, a point of contention so the other thing I, I did want to talk about, though, is the fact that the um, Nasrallah is uh, sounding quite similar uh, to uh, Mao in On Protracted War. And I think that's very much worth revisiting if you want to take away some reading from this, because uh, it's clear that Nasrallah and the, the Hezbollah leaders have quite obviously got an understanding of the... Um, some of the Marxist classics that they probably wouldn't uh, reference directly but it's clear that um, these are men that understand uh, um, Fanon and Mao and other uh, 20th century national liberation fighters and the point to make here is that they have um, they're echoing certain points that Mao makes, which is where he set where he says in um, on protracted war about the fact that the um, the the resistance forces in Palestine right now um, have some of the same um, elements on their side as the Chinese forces did when facing the Japanese, and that is of course the. Uh, partly the, their own skill at resisting the Israeli army but also the changing international situation and the changing international situation is important to bear in mind like 
10 years ago, uh, when the, well, nine years ago, uh, in 2014, when the Israelis were rampaging around the last time in Gaza, and uh, which ultimately ended in a, in a ceasefire, they um, weren't uh, condemned on the same level uh, the, uh, as they are now. They, they weren't um, questioned directly and openly by the Russian government, which was still pursuing um, tolerable relations with them at the time. Uh, they weren't questioned the same way by the Chinese, and they weren't uh, subject to the same level of mobilization internationally as they are being subjected to now. And that shows that they are in a weaker position than they were 10 years ago. And they are actually, the, the level of violence that they are indulging in reflects that they're in a weaker position. And it was pretty violent uh, nine years ago. I remember watching the coverage at the time and going to the the Manchester demonstrations, which, by the way, were much smaller uh, than the ones that they, you see this time around. So the situation regarding um, the strength of Israel, but really the strength of U.S. imperialism now, is more favorable towards um, the Palestinian cause than it was nine years ago. And to echo Mao's point from um, on protracted war, where he says that in relation to the Japanese, that as time went on, that the Japanese position, though initially stronger because they have a more modern um, economy and military than China does, they're, though initially stronger, as time went on, um, the world situation and the domestic situation started to turn against them. And Nasrallah is echoing a certain amount of that now, saying that the time is not on the side of Israel because time is not on the side of U.S. imperialism. And this is why they have engaged in this unprecedented level of violence and brutality, because what they were trying to do was, first of all, to try and make the Palestinian population flee. That failed. Now they're trying to terrorize them into surrender. And Nasrallah made this point as well, saying that the Lebanese population um, was subjected to year after year of um, terror from the Israelis, and that te over, uh, I think around 18,000 people died in the Israeli siege of Beirut in the early 1980s, and that the Israelis launched multiple uh, uh, bombing campaigns, all of which with the aim to brutalize and terrorize the Lebanese population into um, stopping their support for the resistance movement. And this was, again, repeated in Operation Grapes of Wrath in the late 90s, and again uh, with the war in 2006. And Nasrallah made the point, look, we lost thousands of people all the way through that, but it didn't stop the Lebanese masses from resisting. It didn't stop the long-running um, insurgent war against the uh, Israeli occupation of South Lebanon in the end, which ultimately forced the Israelis to pull out. And the point that he's making there, and one that I think we should bear in mind, is that the way insurgents, insurgent warfare works, or the way that, uh, should we say, protracted people's warfare works, is that there's a lot of loss and a lot of horror inflicted by the imperialists before you get to a victory. Like the US imperialists were driven out of Afghanistan. They lost in Afghanistan badly. But on the through the 20 years of occupation, they killed a hell of a lot of Afghans, uh, supposedly Taliban fighters, and an awful lot of people who weren't. And they inflicted all manner of brutalities there. And they still lost. Because, and this is what the point that Nasrallah is driving at, the technological superiority of the imperialists gives them an edge in being able to inflict huge casualties. But also, this is a force that is very weak, despite all the horrors that it can commit, because it's casualty averse. Not that the rulers of Israel uh, particularly give much of a shit um, how many uh, soldiers actually die. They only care in the sense that the Israeli society is 
not prepared to accept mass casualties. And, of course, Hezbollah and the Palestinian National Liberation Fighters, they understand that very well. Uh, they have studied um, Israel, its government, its economy, its society. They have studied it in great depth, both in Lebanon and, of course, the Palestinians have studied it in great depth. And so this is why the attack on October the 7th, as I've said before, was so well executed was because they knew exactly where to hit in terms of doing maximum damage to the Israeli myth about itself, which is that they were this high-tech, unbeatable army. And then suddenly just over a thousand Palestinian uh, fighters come over their border and actually beat some of the supposedly best units in the Israeli army in a stand-up fight and wipe a load of them out. And so this, as um, Nasrallah observed, this has changed the dynamic forever. Uh, Israel's actions, all this mass killing that they're engaging in, principally beyond the, the tactical level, the, the, the plan that they have, the only real plan, is to reinstill the terror again by causing as many deaths as possible. That's what they're doing. And the plan is to, the, the, their only plan is to, to restore the fear factor and the, um, the idea that, they, that the resistance cannot possibly succeed. And this, um, of course, as Nasrallah well says, well, that's gone now. That's changed. No matter what happens now, even if the Israelis manage to carve out something that they can call a win, the fear factor has gone. The dynamic now has completely changed. They can't go back to October the 6th again. They, it's not possible. The dynamic has also changed in the West Bank. Uh, the Palestinian Authority, this sort of corrupt, weak entity which is uh, bought and paid for by U.S. imperialism, is now more endangered and more unpopular than ever. And so that dynamic has changed. The pressure on the Arab reactionaries is intensified to the point where, yes, they're still not prepared to do anything like um, threatening an oil embargo or anything like that because well, they don't want to get into an open conflict with U.S. imperialism yet. But the pressure on them is growing and the pressure on people like Erdogan is growing, who, let's be clear, if it were left up to him, he wouldn't do anything. Uh, regarding the Palestinian situation. He's in business with the Israelis as he's in business with U.S. imperialism. Yes, the two of them fall out and shout at each other every now and again, but he's not moving that uh, U.S., uh, those U.S. military installations out of Turkey anytime soon. He's not giving up on his partnership with Israel in Azerbaijan and building that uh, pan-Turkic um, state there which um, the Israelis certainly hope that they can use to try and carry out some kind of action against Iran. So this isn't a man to be trusted in the slightest. But herein we get to the point, as this was discussed on the Telegram group earlier today, Erdogan and the Turkish ruling class left to their own devices would do nothing for the Palestinians at all, other than give them words. But you have to then factor in several things. You have to, as Mao asks his comrades to do, in on protracted war you can't just view the war through one lens you can't view any set of relations as being permanent and unchanging yes erdogan is full of shit shouldn't be trusted for a second on the other hand you have a, a weakening u.s imperialism which has responded very clumsily and ham-fistedly to this crisis it's visibly losing in ukraine and everybody can see it You've got significant and very large-scale mobilizations on the streets in Turkey, but also in, of course, Amman, in Jordan, and, of course, um, in Iran. You would expect that, but in Iraq and uh, to a certain extent in Egypt, though I don't think they've been as big as elsewhere, but also in some of the Gulf states, in Kuwait, places that you wouldn't normally expect. So the Arab reactionaries and Erdogan in Turkey are feeling the heat, the, the, the relations that have governed the world since the end of the USSR and the counter-revolutions put an end to um, the socialist period in Eastern Europe and um, 
in the USSR. That set of relations is passing away. And so this increases the pressure on everybody. And so a lot of these characters are desperately trying to hold to a position, which it's the, the relations upon which that position has been built uh, are now falling away. And so this is why you've got the various Arab reactionaries, the Jordanian king, uh, Mohammed bin Salman and others, coming out with stronger and stronger public condemnations of the conduct of Israel. But it's also why Nasrallah is correctly, he, he is not really talking to them. He's talking to the masses in the Arab world. And he's saying, well, look, Israel is just a tool. The role of U.S. imperialism, that is the central problem facing us, not just in, um, in, in, in Gaza, but also in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere. The central problem is the role of U.S. imperialism. And therefore, the only way to address the problems faced by the Palestinians is to increase the campaign against U.S. imperialism. And that's, of course, what Nasrallah is aiming at. And so what he's essentially saying is to people who are demanding uh, imminent action, immediate action, immediate war, he isn't saying that, um, that, that Hezbollah will not assist the Palestinians. They already are. What he's saying is that this is going to be a protracted war, a protracted struggle. And it's a struggle which isn't just directed against the, Israel, the Zionist state. Yet, it, obviously, it is. But it also has to be directed against U.S. imperialism. And it's clear that, what, that Nasrallah is, if you want to put it in Maoist terms, he's identifying the primary contradiction, which is the role of U.S. imperialism. And if the Arab masses can force U.S. imperialism out of the region, a difficult thing to do because they will not want to lose the positions that they have there. But if they can be weakened and if they can be forced out, well, Tony Blinken himself confirmed in a recent statement, though not that he meant to do this, that it, when U.S. imperialism is weakened, then Israel will go down because he said as long as the U.S. exists, Israel will never have to fight alone. And he's confirming essentially the role of Israel. And we'll come back to the role of Israel and the proper demands about this that should be raised in the West in a moment. So that's the, the, the nature of the speech that he, he gave today. It's very much on the lines of that this is a slow burn struggle. The Palestinians are waging one particular variant of it at the moment. There are other variants of this that are linked together in Lebanon, in Syria, and in Iraq, and that this is going to grow. And of course, he makes his customary appeal to the wider masses, and that the struggle against US imperialism has to be the priority. And of course, this is getting an echo, this is getting taken up, uh, because Biden has, uh, and the US imperialists, political leadership, have done um, Nasrallah and the axis of resistance in the region an enormous favor in that they've come out by rushing to shore up the Israeli state with this great military transfer of um, naval forces and air forces and some ground forces to the region. What they've done is they've made who is in charge absolutely clear so that even those in the region who might have got things the wrong way around in the past, I've spoken to plenty of people from um, Arab nations in the past who thought that Israel ran the United States. Well, the United States has just made things absolutely clear that the United States runs Israel. And not only that, that without the United States, there is no Israel. And this is what Nasrallah is putting across, that this is a long struggle, that the, the target isn't just Israel, the target is much bigger. It is U.S. imperialism and its presence in the region that needs to be pressured to the point where it quits. And that's his point. And it's also he's making this point to some of the perhaps some of the, the more angrier types in his own movement by saying to them, look, we have a plan to tackle this, that Israel will go down, but it's going to take 
a long and concerted struggle and it's going to fa- and going to face a lot of difficulties in doing so so he's asking his um, the the Hezbollah supporters in Lebanon and work further afield to uh, be prepared for a long and bitter struggle but one which will ultimately um that they will come out triumphant from and i think it was a very interesting speech and again He's plainly somebody who's very well versed in all kinds of political theory, even though, of course, he puts everything in the terms of um, um, Shia Islam. But very much is a man who is well read in all of the national liberation uh, theorists and practitioners of the last century. So I'll catch up now with comments before moving on to another issue. James Graham says they, uh, I think you're referring to the government in here, hire thugs to go around the pubs and clubs to start a Barney. That gets into the media, they get their exposure. Yeah, this is standard operating practice. Good evening to Peter, who's catching up at tw- two times speed all the way from perfidious Albion itself. Hello to Jay, who's sitting in the Imperial Corps. Good evening to Burke. Philbin says, aside from impressive response by Yemen and Lebanon, lack of past pan-Arab solidarity is dismaying, if not surprising. Hashimi Abdullah's absurd warning should lead to revolt in Jordan. Well, maybe it will. I mean, I'm not surprised myself. Um, again, like, this isn't 1960. There's um, we're, we're coming out of 30 years of reaction. But I'd say that Yemen, Lebanon, Syria, and uh, the movements in Iraq are all significant. And the movement and the, the movements of the masses in Lebanon are very significant and should worry um, King Abdullah if he wants to keep hold of his throne. Um, yes, um, there is actually a, an equivalent of a Ba'ath party in Jordan. I'm not quite sure how strong it is, but there is a Ba'ath party there, to answer Philbin's point. Peter says the grotesque avoidance of that solidarity may well be a key factor in intensifying it in the Arab masses. I think the what's happening is that there is intensifying contradictions between the leaders and the masses now. I mean, the, this is why I say that the attack on October the 7th was so very well designed because it's not only is it basically compelled the Israelis to respond in a typical colonialist, ultra-violent fashion, but it's also revealed the role of U.S. imperialism and revealed the role of the Arab compradors before the eyes of the masses. And that is something which is very much to be welcomed by anybody who uh, wants to see uh, the defeat of the U.S. imperialists. The, in, the, in the hands of the masses lies the future. Philbin says, degree of Palestinian success and IDF bumbling should mean regarding borders or future negotiations, the Zionist project does not have a 1967 problem but a 1947 problem no matter how long it takes yeah and the, as Nasrallah is saying it may take m- months or more many more years um but the fact is that the turning point has been arrived at and that the continued losses that the Palestinians have been suffering since Arafat signed up to the Oslo Accords have started to be reversed now. Tim Gray says, if you haven't covered the problems with the two-state solution as proposed by some on the left, could you go through it and what it really means? I can go through it in the upcoming Q&A, Tim. If you're okay with that, please let me know in the chat. Uh, And that will be out probably on Monday. Uh, No, Monday, Tuesday of next week, I think I'm going to do the Q&A. So the other thing I wanted to comment upon tonight... um, was just the the demands coming out of the protests and the uh, anti-imperialist and anti-war, anti-Israel protests across the world, and particularly in the imperial centers. Because I think mean, we need to be absolute, certainly communists need to be absolutely clear about our slogans and our um, objectives here. Because there's a lot of people... Um, in the United States who are making a mistake in the way that they are um, addressing this problem. There's a lot of people claiming basically that the um, the Israel lobby runs Congress, that the Israeli tail is wagging the American dog, 
um, that members of Congress are swearing allegiance to a foreign country when they go on about how much they love Israel, and that uh, we're spending all this money in Israel and uh, people in the U.S. are going without. Now, there's elements of that which are true, of course, and the same arguments popped up from like the Marjorie Taylor Greene types over Ukraine, or why are we spending all this money in Ukraine when uh, we've got problems in America? Now, there's a there's two problems with that approach, both with regard to Ukraine and with regard to Israel. First of all, um, it's inaccurate to say that the U.S. is giving money to Ukraine uh, or Israel. But let's deal with Ukraine first because I met, I brought it up. The money for Ukraine doesn't go to Ukraine. The money might go through Ukraine, but it ends up back in the United States. As, by the way, Nikki Haley and Lindsey Graham were quite accurately stated when they were looking to defend this, as did Mitch McConnell or whoever was programming Mitch McConnell's brain for that day. They said quite accurately, no, 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 that money doesn't go um, to Ukraine. It goes to American companies. And they're right. All that money, all those billions that the um, U.S. has spent um, funding the war doesn't go to Ukrainians. Um, it goes to, of course, as Graham and Haley and McConnell pointed out, it goes through Ukraine and back to the United States. Just the same way as I believe it was two trillion dollars spent in um, Afghanistan and the occupation for 20 years. That didn't go to Afghanistan. As Julian Assange and WikiLeaks pointed out, it basically Afghanistan operated as a money laundering scheme. So it goes, the money went through Afghanistan and came back to the United States again. And it's, a lot of it is uh, going to be the same when it comes to Israel. And so saying that um, this money is going to Israel, where, why are we spending money on Israel? This isn't accurate. It isn't strictly accurate. What's going on with regard, especially with regard to the, the billions in military aid to Israel every year? That money is going through Israel and back to the U.S. ruling class again. That's the more accurate way to put it. So to say that, uh, well, we're giving money to country X, Y, and Z, this is a similar argument that was used by, like, supposedly conservative critics of the British Empire in the 1890s and 1900s who would claim routinely that the colonies cost the British Treasury more than they brought in, which wasn't true, by the way. Uh, the amount extracted from India over the course of British occupation was gargantuan. So the, the better way to put this and to talk to people about it isn't that we're giving money to Israel or we're giving money to Ukraine. The better way to put it is that Israel or Ukraine or anywhere else where the U.S. gives a large amount of military aid or more wider aid, should we say, is that this basically is an investment project for the U.S. ruling class and that they're the ones who are ultimately reaping the benefits from it. Um, you've seen, I mean, if you read Max Blumenthal's book, The Management of Savagery, he outlines in there how many fortunes were made via the wars uh, waged by the Bush administration and others after September 11, 2001, and how many suburbs of Washington, D.C. or around Washington, D.C. were built um, using money that had been essentially uh, rinsed through various different conflicts then came back into the United States again. And more to the point, to deal with the idea that, um, that various congressmen, like that Brian Mast guy who's wearing an IDF uniform and looking like a twat, um, that they're swearing allegiance to a foreign country. This is also an inaccurate way of putting things. Israel is a U.S. colonial enterprise, meaning that the congressmen who don't see any difference between swearing allegiance to Israel and swearing allegiance to U.S. imperialism, or the U.S. as they will put it, they don't see any contradiction there. They're right. It's the same. The Israel is not an independent country. Um, it's a U.S. military encampment. It's a U.S. colonial military operation in the Middle East. Um, to answer Jenny's point, we certainly don't see any of it, though. That's, that's the way to put it. The way to put it isn't that the U.S. is giving money to Israel. The way to put it is that the U.S. ruling class 
is running this colonial military operation in the Middle East and that the money that does go in there, an awful lot of that is coming straight back to the United States and into the pockets of the ruling class. And so the, the American worker is getting stiffed in two directions with regard to this. First of all, of course, the of course the US state will not spend money on health care or improving the education system or any of the other myriad or improving the infrastructure in the United States. But they will send money to their proxy wars and their colonial operations because these are investments for them in wider terms to serve their interests. Now, in, the interest in Ukraine is, of course, in trying to cause the collapse of the Russian government. The interest in Israel is trying to, well, can initially secure the continued existence of this colonial enterprise, but more broadly to continue its purpose, which is to keep the Middle East weak and divided and stuck between various different comprador rulers, all of, and to enable the US to project power in the region, all of which is enabled by the existence of this colonial military encampment that Israel represents, that Israel is. And so that is the proper way to, in my view, put this across. Going down the road of like echoing Trump's rhetoric about uh, why are we spending all this money on Ukraine, folks? It's mad. Um, that might seem appealing because you might think that well, Trump has opened the door on that, so we should go through it. Well, in my view, if you're echoing false rhetoric and giving people the wrong impression, that is not positive. Um, the working class in the United States or Britain or wherever is discontented and ready to hear arguments that are real, not fake ones that echo the dubious points of Trump. Because again, as Trump's critics in the Republican Party correctly put it, uh, that money all comes back to the United States. Yes, it does. But whose pocket does it go into is the question. That money might go through Israel or through Ukraine or through wherever else and back into the United States. But it's another means of the ruling class enriching itself. And it's enriching itself, really, not only at the expense of Ukrainians or Palestinians, Russians, but also at the expense of the American worker, because the true problem of imperialism, for, from the point of view, or one of the true problems of imperialism, if you're a worker in the United States, is that you've faced 50 years of deindustrialization caused by, of course, the uh, falling rate of profit in the United States. And we're going to be doing a full show on what that means in the in the coming week. So Keep, a, keep your eyes peeled for that one. But the falling rate of profit in the United States or any of the imperialist countries um, pushes the ruling class into dealing more in the export of capital rather than commodities and having commodities manufactured increasingly outside of the United States and brought in. The support of Ukraine or Ukrainian, the Ukrainian proxy war and the Israeli colonial enterprise is all about making sure that the conditions for the investment of capital outside the United States are made more favorable and kept favorable. That's what that's about. It's about enabling more capital to flow out of the United States, to be invested elsewhere, to render more profits for the ruling class than they would get via investment inside the US itself. So again, the American worker keeps losing out no matter what policy is pursued. And Trump's arguments about, well, well, why are we wasting the money outside uh, the, the United States are false because the bulk of the American ruling class are seeing great profits from those investments, those investments in proxy wars, those investments in um, the, the Israeli military colonial state. And it is the proper way, putting this the proper way and actually explaining to workers how imperialism works and ultimately hollows out um, the American economy by moving to something which is mainly oriented around the export of capital, that's something that people will understand if it is explained properly. So this going down the route of um, echoing Trump 
might sound appealing, but it is opportunistic and it is short-sighted and it is foolish. Don't underestimate the ability of the worker to understand things if they're properly explained. And that's the point that I want to conclude on uh, on this particular evening. So um, let's see, where are we now? Uh, right, President Jesus says, uh, I've seen Greenwald flirt with this argument. Seems like pandering to MAGA types. That's correct. Um, Philbin says, the Negev, for example, should be realistic objective for the Palestinians in the future, I'm guessing. Interesting point. Ash says, Israel seems to be casualty averse and go on a bombing rampage, but boots on the ground will be longer war with more casualties like Russia, so Israel has no choice but to act crazy. Yeah, they're trying to overwhelm um, the Palestinians to the point where they give up, and so far it doesn't look like they're succeeding. Good point. Big Meanie says, New York had another big... Uh, pro-Palestine demo 30k was a respectable number for a Thursday afternoon that's pretty good uh, Jenny says it's so nice of us to fund Israel's healthcare when we don't have any uh, RFK Jr. let the cat out of the bag regarding US-Israel relationship well yeah RFK Jr. I don't know if he's in, intentionally telling the truth now uh, in the disguise of being pro-Israel but he was very blunt in his assessment of the U.S.-Israel relationship, and we should uh, thank him for his service um, because he d described the reasons for the U.S. to continue backing Israel. And essentially, he put it in the same terms that I would put it, but he said it was a good thing. <laughs> um, Big Mini says, interesting that even in Ukraine with the largest Jewish population outside Israel, pro-Israel demos only have at most a few dozen people. Yeah, it's not popular. Um, it was. Um, it, it's not popular, and they need they need elements of the state machine to seriously get behind them and start organising them to get people out. Because it's not a popular position. Um, same with the fascist mobilisation here. Uh, e even amongst fascist circles, going out and brawling for Israel isn't going to be a particularly popular. Uh, there are quite a lot of pro-Zionist fascists, though, it must be said. Uh, Philbin says, that is the real test. Does the Yank recognize the Zionist entity is our U.S. imperial outpost, or do they hold on to the confused borderline anti-Semitic delusion that Israel controls us? Well, our job as communists to get is to puncture through the delusion. And that's why when I see people pandering to it, it rather um, it, it annoys me. Because it's easily debunked and you need to tell people the truth. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to build a successful communist politics off repeating, like, you know, points from Pat Buchanan. Uh, Muzzle Paint about, says about 1,000 showed up to protest at Biden's house in Wilmington, Delaware. Excellent. Did Biden himself come out to see you? Because uh, that would be funny. But it's an excellent, excellent demo. I mean, when's the last time Wilmington, Delaware saw any kind of significant political demonstration? Uh I don't know if anybody in the chat knows. Martin, looking forward to the talk on the falling rate of profit. Well, we'll keep your eyes peeled for the com com upcoming week then. Philbin says, you've pointed out that if it, you've pointed out that does not mean the imperialist client state will not occasionally act in contradiction to the hegemon. They will always come back and ultimately will not deviate. Yeah, they'll, they ha will have rows with each other. Like the British and their proxies will have rows with each other. Like the British would lock up a lot of uh, loyalist paramilitaries in Northern Ireland, in um, in the occupied six counties, all the way through um, the Irish, or the should we say the second, or is it the third Irish War of Independence, um, Irish War of National Liberation, that ended temporarily with the Good Friday Agreement. Um, they would lock up these guys who were working for them because they needed to preserve the illusion of even-handedness um, and um, law and order, but. Everybody knew that they were working together. So these proxy forces will occasionally fall out with the, the hegemon, but they, they're not in a serious way that would jeopardize the relationship yet. Uh, maybe at some point in the future such a split will be um, triggered. President Jesus says, Batya Unger Sargon also made the more honest case that support for Israel was in an America first position because of the profits of imperialism. Well, good of her to have uh, uh, basically done a reverse Lenin. <laughs> um, yeah, they've all been making that point. Like the Republicans, it's interesting. 
the maybe the one positive achievement of Trump was that that case that he made, which was false, forced them to come out and say, no, 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 look, um, all of this money comes back into the United States. And of course, um, there's elements of the labor aristocracy that will profit from it, but the overwhelming bulk of American workers will not. And that's the point to make, that this is that imperialism is a game run for the ruling class that only ever benefits them, and that most American workers are just going to end up screwed by it. Jenny says Biden probably slept through the protest, to be honest. Yeah, probably true. <coughs> Muzzle Paint says Biden is in D.C. Uh, going to Arlington Cemetery for U.S. Veterans Day. OK, right. OK, well, I'll be back tomorrow with two programs. Firstly, the second part of the ongoing series on the Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. That's on Patreon. And then another one of these streams from 8 till 9 tomorrow night. So... Until then, I will thank everybody for tuning in and for contributing to the discussion. And I will be back with you again tomorrow. But I will now return you to the music. Oh, Stalin was a mighty man, and a mighty man was he. He led the Soviet people on the road to victory. All through the revolution, he fought at Lenin's side, and they made a combination till the day that Lenin died. said, come all you people, we must work with brain and hand. And then one day the Nazis came into the Soviet land. They plundered to the Volga, to Stalingrad, and then Joe Stalin said, come on me boys, and take them out again. <laughs> <laughs>